Ni hao. <laughs> At the first seminar this summer, Ted Olson, discussion of trade, noted that China should not be considered the enemy but a partner in trade. And at the second, John Holdren made clear that China is now a bigger CO2 emitter than the US, and that in 19, or 2014, the meeting between President Obama and President Xi was, and pun intended, a climate changer, bringing in uh, India and China into the discussion of climate change. However, in addition to trade and climate change, there are issues of national security. Hong Kong, where rioting yesterday appears bigger than ever. Immigration, human rights, and treatment of dissidents and journalists. What policy should our government be focusing on vis-a-vis -vis China, and are they? These are pieces of a bigger puzzle, and today's speaker, Robert Daly, is the ideal person to put them in more in an appropriate context and help us understand that if we are at a brink in our relations uh, with China, whether and how can we step back? Robert Daly has been a diplomat, professor of Chinese, interpreter for both US and Chinese leaders, producer of the Chinese language Sesame Street, and is now head of the Kissinger Institute on China and the US at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. He's here with his son, Matteo, and they have been taking full advantage of what Steamboat has to offer. To be hiking up to Rabbit Ears and Fish Creek Falls, the Alpine Slide, soaking in the hot springs, so now it is our turn to take advantage of what he has to offer. So please join me in giving him a big steamboat welcome. Bob's description of our activities makes my son and myself and Steamboat Springs sound really quite decadent. Uh, it's been a wonderful two days, and I wanted to start just by thanking all of you uh, for the chance to be here today, especially to Bob and Debbie. And now as I begin, I see that I've got my notes. There we go, in the right order. So thank you for making this possible. It's been a, a wonderful few days. Uh, this morning when I was going to Rabbit Ears Overpass, just as I got out of the car, I got a phone call uh, from the New Yorker journalist Robin Wright, uh, who was working on a piece about Hong Kong, and she wanted to talk to me about Hong Kong, and, and she said, well, you, you, where are you? You sound like you're panting. That was, I was walking up to Rabbit Ears, and I said, I'm in Steamboat Springs, and she just started to rhapsodize. She was here in 2011. I, I gather many of you probably saw her, but about the discussion she had and the hospitality and the place. And apparently her mother, many, many years earlier, had danced here in Steamboat Springs, and you took her to the site of that. She was very moved, and uh, I agreed that I would extend her greetings to all of you. So consider yourselves greeted, uh, not only by me, but by Robin Wright. I also, because the Wilson Center where I work is, is quite close to Congress, I know that many of your legislators are very concerned about the issues we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, I had a 90-minute discussion with Senator Bennett uh, last December up on the Hill. I was with Senator Gardner uh, this February down in San Diego talking about US-China, and I just spent a week on this issue uh, in Prague with your Congressman Scott Tipton in May, and I told him I was going to be visiting uh, with all of you, and we spoke quite a bit about the seminars at Steamboat, and he's sorry that he couldn't be here tonight, but he was very glad that we were going to be discussing this. So these are all matters of great concern to your representatives. As you no doubt know, uh, we are in the midst of a number of historic transformations, one of the most important of which is a change in China itself and a related change in US-China relations. For the past 40 years, since the opening uh, of formal diplomatic relations in 1979, the relationship has been 
uh, conducted under the key, it's not really a policy, but a keynote, a strategic disposition, which we called engagement, which was based on a belief in working with China and co-evolution, the idea that cooperating to the greatest extent possible was the best way to have some influence on the course of China's development and to bring it uh, into the global system, such as it is, uh, this notion that there is an established set global liberal order is a sort of a dubious uh, proposition. Uh, but the idea was to bring China in to the extent that we could. And engagement was about cooperating whenever possible, about mutual understanding, about coevolution. And it's largely over, at least from the Washington point of view. Uh, we are now in the midst of a newly contentious relationship. Some have called it rivalrous adversarial, uh, a growing number of voices in Washington and in Beijing uh, see the United States and China as adversaries. This is a big development, and that is why the question of today's discussion is, can we pull back from the brink? Obvious first question, from the brink of what? Well, there are different answers to this. I think uh, many in Washington would say that we need to pursue decoupling with China, disengagement, a separation into two different supply chains, two different spheres of influence. So maybe we're at the brink of decoupling. If we take that one step further, we are perhaps at the brink of something like a new Cold War. Uh, I reject this historical analogy so far, uh, but the relationship continues to deteriorate, and we don't know that, we don't, that we're not headed there. And then, uh, are we actually headed toward increased possibility of military conflict, of hot war? And we'll touch on all of these issues uh, as we go through the discussion today. But before we get to this newly contentious relationship, I'd be trying to recall, if you can, and I know many of you probably participated in it or witnessed it, the excitement of rediscovery after the opening in 1979, the relief of leaving behind the enmity of the Cold War when we fought each other in uh, the Korean War and actually were also at, at uh, enemies during the Vietnam War when we're learning more and more about how many Chinese were actually involved in that conflict, there was a great, very natural human relief and excitement of rediscovery in the 1980s. Could I just ask for hands on how many people have been to China, the PRC? <sighs> Okay, well, good. That's, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised, but you've, so you've probably seen some of this, you know, the ambition, the energy, the excitement uh, in China itself. So how did we get there? How did we get from that energy, that excitement, that curiosity about each other, that mutual problem solving, mutual education and institution building uh, that characterized the 80s? How did we get to where we are now? And so I would like to discuss this um, in sort of three phases. One, a brief history of how we got here. Two, a look at our current strategies toward China and what's missing in them. And then lastly, I'd like to suggest uh, an approach to US-China relations that I think is still lacking in Washington, DC, and that could help stabilize what are certainly going to remain contentious relations. So how did we get here? Well, the biggest change that brought us to where we are today has been the unprecedented development in China itself since 1979. Uh, and we have to keep coming back to the fact that never before have so many people seen such a great increase in their standard of living in such a short period of time. 400 to 800 million, depending on how you count, Chinese lifted out of poverty and now set on a course where China, not the United States, has the world's largest middle class. Uh, whatever you may think of the China challenge, this is a tremendous human achievement. But with that success, there has been a resultant and I think unsurprising reawakening of traditional Chinese attitudes and ambitions. China, Zhongguo is the modern term for that, means middle kingdom. Not only the kingdom at the center of the world, which is the source of all civilization, but also with the Middle Kingdom idea, China is in the middle in that it is the country between heaven and earth that mediates and translates between the two. There is an assumption, a deep assumption in China of civilizational supremacy, and it's founded in China's tremendous historic success, 
and then reawakened by China's very impressive rise. One of the even more ancient words for China, other than Zhongguo, was Tianxia. Tianxia, which means everything under heaven, all that there is. So American exceptionalism, founded as it is in you know, 250 years of history, has nothing on China's sense of its own destiny, its rights, and its specialness. Um, and we're seeing a reawakening of that in Chinese foreign policy. Uh, there's a book out which is very influential, especially um, with my Republican colleagues in Washington, by Michael Pillsbury called The Hundred Year Marathon, uh, which claims that China has a secret plan for 100 years of policy to overtake the United States. You don't need a secret plan to explain where China's foreign policy is. What matters is that China has an extremely deep cultural predisposition to being the most influential nation on earth. And we're seeing that play out now. So that's the big change. But China is also uh, a constant student of and observer of the United States and our power. And China has been studying America's military, economic, political and cultural power closely since 1979, and to a certain degree has been willing to regard America in a, in a limited way as China's tutor in some of these areas. China has been very willing to study American models, to try to mimic and adapt American institutions in the military, economic, and to some degree the institutional spheres. But it has also watched changes in America. I'd like to run you sort of through a, a thumbnail description of U.S.-China history since, 19, uh, since the late 80s uh, from the Chinese point of view and what lessons has China learned. So let's start with 1989, the Tiananmen Movement and the Tiananmen Massacre, after which the United States uh, strongly condemned China as a human rights violator, which of course it is. But the United States made these critiques after 10 years of uh, sort of a golden era in U.S.-China relations in which while there were human rights issues, they weren't the focus of U.S.-China relations. A kind of a celebratory mutual discovery had been the keynote of the past 10 years. And then with 1989, which the Communist Party said they had to do to promote stability, the United States and much of the rest of the world condemned China. And China took note of the fact that the United States was not, from its point of view, a reliable partner. This is followed in 1990 by the first Gulf War, which I actually watched from the American Embassy in Beijing where I was stationed. And if you remember the first Gulf War, which is what made CNN what it was, um, it sort of begins the 24-hour news cycle. And it also brought home to Americans and to the rest of the world and to the Chinese what American modern military capability looked like. And most of the world didn't know that America had you know, missiles that could go to your door at, you know, in Baghdad, knock, ask if the terrorist master was at home, and if he is, go in and explode. This is what it looked like uh, for, for the Chinese, and they realized that they were nowhere near to having a modern military, that they had no answer to American military power, and their determination to correct that dates back to 1990. It was strengthened in 1995, during the Taiwan crisis, after the president of Taiwan, Li Donghui, came to the United States, China lobbed a few missiles into waters near Taiwan, and President Clinton sent two aircraft carriers into the region of the Taiwan Straits to tell China to back off, which it did. It did because it had to, because it had no capability which could counter aircraft carriers. And the military determined upon that foundation of 1990 that this would not be the case next time around that American aircraft carriers were not going to call the shots next time it got hot in the Taiwan Straits. 1997, 98, and the Asian financial crisis, when China uh, kept its cool, kept its currency relatively under control, and this was one of the factors that helped stabilize Asian economies, Southeast Asian economies especially, in 99 and, and, uh, and, I'm sorry, 97 and 98. And China learned from that, that it had developed enough that it could begin to provide real leadership and public goods to Southeast Asia. It was no longer a recipient of the largesse of other nations. It could begin to call some of the economic shots. This was followed by 1999, 2001. 1999, we bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade by accident. China does not believe this was an accident uh, and killed three 
uh, Chinese journalists. They weren't actually journalists, they were spies, and they were killed because they were on the floor that was of the embassy that was hit, which happened to be the floor where the Chinese intelligence services communications technologies were. It would help convince them that this was an accident if we hadn't hit that floor. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I, I believe that it was an accident, uh, but th that followed by the 2001 incident that you probably remember when our EP3 spy plane was hit in international airspace by a Chinese hotshot pilot who died, had to scuttle on Hainan Island, and they took uh, our crew hostage for about a week and then let them go. But these two incidents showed China that despite all of its considerable development, uh, it still really couldn't counter American military power. It strengthened China's regard to build up its capacity. And this was really brought to a head by 9-11 and the forever wars which followed them, which really put from China's point of view again, this is Chinese point of view, China's lesson learned, this put the lie to the notion of American military superiority. It was a story about American weakness because the United States with all of its advanced technology that China had seen during the first Gulf War couldn't even solve the problem in Afghanistan. So America's military superiority while still recognized, we are seen as invincible. Uh, then the 2008 global financial crisis convinced many Chinese that, in fact, we didn't have all the answers about finance and economics and were once again vincible, fallible. Followed then by the 2016 presidential election and not so much the result of that, but all of the sturm und drang and dissatisfaction around it, which looks to much of the rest of the world like a political and cultural crisis in the United States. That completes the triumvirate. The forever wars, the notion that America has all the military answers is gone. The global financial crisis, the notion that we have all the economic and financial answers gone. 2016 election, American institutions called into question. This results in a widespread view in China that the United States is a declining power and China's days of tutelage are over. It's over. Xi Jinping has been very clear on this. Chinese answers for a developing China, Chinese answers for an Asian region in which China should be the preeminent power. China has now announced that it is seeking what it calls comprehensive national power. Comprehensive national power. That's the phrase, direct translation from the Chinese. What do they mean by that? They mean that they'd sort of like to have what we have. They have been studying, they have felt subject to American power since the end of World War II, including not only American military power, economic and financial power, the fact that the United States is the international reserve currency. They have felt subject to what they call uh, American discursive power, the fact that we, are, we control many of the media stories worldwide and are able to tell our story. We tend to control also uh, the hard aspects of media, just as it drives a lot of my Chinese friends nuts that the US dollar is the international reserve currency, it drives them nuts that for every internet address you type in, they've got to put a .cn at the end of theirs, but there is no .usa. Okay, that speaks volumes, as does the fact that English is the international language. This is all understood as, as an aspect of power, American cultural power, soft power. China under, has been looking at it, they think they understand it, and they kind of think the time is right to try this on for size for China, and that's perfectly understandable. That in itself is not nefarious. It would be surprising if they didn't feel that way. So, US-China relations today, it's a global competition. It is a worldwide competition to be the primary nation shaping security architectures, trade, economic, and financial regimes, global norms and, and, and practices, international law, value systems that underlie them, and very importantly, and this is new, it's a competition to shape the development, marketization, and regulation of new technologies. And that's the focus of a lot of this competition. The goal of Chinese foreign policy, I believe, is to shape a world that is highly integrated. China's very sincere about that. This has worked to China's advantage. Highly integrated and wholly accepting of the practices and prerogatives of the PRC as ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. So that's where we find ourselves. This is viewed uh, as a major challenge or as a major threat in Washington, D.C. on a bipartisan basis. There has been perhaps no starker 
expression of that sense of China as a threat than the recent formation of what is called the Committee on the Present Danger China, which harkens back to the Cold War Committee on the Present Danger. Uh, and it is led by uh, Steve Bannon, and it includes people like Newt Gingrich, who is currently writing a China book. Um, maybe we can talk about that next summer. I think it'll be out <laughs> by then. Now, the Committee for the Present Danger China and a growing number of members of Congress, and again, I want to stress again, this is, this is a bipartisan consensus. It has Democratic and Republican flavorings if you look at the different sides of it, but it's really a bipartisan uh, consensus increasingly in Washington. Uh, but the more hardline folks actually now say that China is a mortal, is an existential threat. This is, this is the explicit claim of the committee for the present danger of China and several other congressional committees. That's an extraordinary statement. China is an existential threat. Is that true? Hey, what is an existential threat? It means a threat to our existence, right? In, 19, in 1838, Lincoln, this is he was very young, it was before he was president, he said, from whence shall we expect the approach of danger? Shall some transatlantic military giant step the earth and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe and Asia could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River or make a track on the Blue Ridge in the trial of a thousand years. That's an existential threat, the transatlantic giant. No, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we will live forever or die by suicide. Be careful of this existential threat language. I was at a typical DC dinner uh, in the middle of last week, and it had uh, a Chinese and an American human rights activist, two career CIA types, uh, a diplomat, and this became the, the, dis the discussion at the dinner was, is China an existential threat? And I was, I was saying that it wasn't, um, but some of my friends were saying, no, it's an existential threat to our values. It's an existential threat to our way of life. And I said, this is, this is really impermissible language. Uh, definitions are not infinitely elastic. Um, and I, I think we need to be careful about the way that we speak about existential threats. And if we use this term so loosely, uh, we actually take all of the sting out of the word threat, which is a perfectly good and serviceable word. Uh, not all threats are existential threat. threat is very, very serious. It means focus on the issue, prepare now. Existential threat means please pass the ammunition. It's a different level. Uh, if a nation has the capability and the intention to do us harm, it is a threat. If such a nation is taking action or preparing to take action that could annihilate us, if the danger is imminent, then it is an existential threat. U.S.-China relations are bad and getting worse, but they're not that bad. I think we need to be resistant to this notion of existential threat. China is a challenge. Uh, I don't speak of it as a threat, but I'm not going to argue with the point. It's, uh, if you wish to speak of it as a threat, that's fine. What kind of challenge or threat is it? I think we need to focus first on what kind of threat China doesn't pose to the United States. We're in Washington right now, with this new consensus, which I believe is an overreaction, we lack proportionality. I have just sort of for fun in my off hours started to keep a list of American problems that are not of China's making. Do try this at home. It's extremely uh, educational. So I'm gonna run through, just, this is sort of my own personal list of what I think are pretty big challenges that we face as Americans in which China really doesn't have a hand. The collapse of bipartisanship in Washington, not China's fault. The legitimization of anger as the engine of our politics, not China's fault. The loss of a common culture, common cause, and a belief in common good in the United States. China didn't do that. Augustine said that a nation should be defined as a multitude of rational beings in common agreement as to the objects of their love. I don't think that's where we are right now. And I don't, think that's, I don't think that's China's fault. The growing federal deficit, the long-term structural budget crisis, our inability to come up with a workable immigration policy, healthcare system, or plan to reinvest in infrastructure, not China's fault. The fact that we are globally bleeding out soft power, 
our failure to uphold and strengthen alliances, the fact that automation threatens the jobs of so many Americans, the rich-poor disparity general, generally, the social crises in rural and urban America. Not China's fault, this is all on us. The fact that the United States now has the world's highest incarceration rate. The fact that CEO pay is now 70 to 300 times that of workers on the factory floor. China did not do that. The fact as we try to discourage the rest of the world from using China's company Huawei in their build out of 5G, and there are serious issues with Huawei we can talk about if you would like. But the fact that America has no competitor to Huawei, that's not China's fault. Again, that's on us. There are some voices now that will want to close our universities to Chinese students. A growing number. The president himself is reported as having, as having said they are all spies. If we send them all home tomorrow, almost every academic laboratory, national laboratory, and corporate laboratory in the United States closes down. And the fact that there are not American STEM PhD students to take their place, that's not China's fault. So it's a partial list. I think that these sort of hint at the fact that most of America's major problems are not China's fault. So this is another reason to be careful about this existential threat notion. But the existential threat notion is operative. Last October 4th, Vice President Pence gave a, a speech about China at the Hudson Institute, and it was a historic speech. I don't think it had ever been done before. It's been likened to uh, Churchill's Fulton, Missouri Iron Curtain speech. The Vice President basically issued a declaration of hostility toward China and gave sort of a bill of indictment, all of the complaints uh, that, China, that the United States has against China. He said that China was a bad actor within its own borders, where it's got a major human rights problem, always has, it's getting worse. Yes, about a million Uyghurs are imprisoned in re-education camps in Xinjiang. He said China is a bad actor internationally, where it is using its, its lending to, uh, to conduct what it calls debt trap diplomacy, uh, and is basically uh, putting very poor nations into further uh, debt, which, uh, which it then uses to take over assets in those nations to build its power. And Vice President Pence said uh, that China is also a bad actor within the borders of the United States, where the Communist Party is using various methods to try to influence American um, communities and American institutions. Now, uh, most of what the President said, his complaints about China, this sort of indictment that he laid out, was correct and important and long-standing. Uh, a few things he said were exaggerations and one or two were just straight up silly. Uh, but for the most part, his complaints were complaints that the Chinese had been hearing from a series of American presidents, Democratic and Republican, and that China has to a degree ignored, although I'm dealing in very broad strokes now. So if you want to get into any one issue, please feel free to challenge that. But, pres but Vice President, Pence's speech only laid out America's attitude toward China. He did not lay out any policies, much less strategies. And what I would like to suggest now, I'd like to ask a few questions about this attitude that America has toward China, which is leading us in a certain direction, um, and see what is missing from that. What are the questions we need to ask if we're going to have an effective strategy to counter China? And so these are questions that I'm asking to the sort of the hardest core uh, advocates of long-term adversity with China. One, do the American people throughout the country support this bipartisan beltway consensus on China? Do they agree that China is an existential threat or a bad actor? This is going to be, U.S.-China relations, a decades-long high-stakes competition. And if we do not have popular buy-in, the United States cannot possibly meet what the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, says is a whole of society threat from China with what, again, this is Director Wray says, we need a whole of society response. It's not at all clear that Americans throughout the country share this view of China as a threat. American views of China, according to most Gallup and Pew polls, are declining slightly, but only from historic highs post-1989. Most Americans still don't see China as a major threat. Uh, and this, this, I think, is a, is a big question. I was Yesterday morning, my son and I were drifting down the Yampa River. 
And this is, you know, marvelous. Here are all these happy families from all over the country, you know, getting cold, getting wet, drifting off, running off for ice cream, running off for the hot springs. Uh, China doesn't seem to pose a threat to any of this. I don't sense that any of these people is drifting down the Yampa thinking that Xi Jinping. <laughs> it's, it's just, I don't think it's felt. It isn't a socialized threat. You know, during the Cold War, the threat from the Soviet Union was broadly and deeply socialized. It was understood. I don't think we have that in, in the United States. But number two, even if Americans do agree that this relationship is fundamentally competitive, and this is really key, are Americans willing to pay the costs of a sustained global rivalry with China? You know, we're in the midst of a trade war right now. I do a lot of, um, you might have C-SPAN Washington Journal. I don't know if anybody watches this show. Uh, but we get a lot of calls from all over the country. And a lot of the calls when we're talking about the trade war come from farmers, people who are in real distress. They had been selling soybeans to China. They've been selling corn. And now they can't. And we've made, I think, $27 billion that the federal government has now paid to subsidize them for their loss. So on the one hand, the government is saying this is an existential threat and long -term, uh, greatest long-term strategic challenge to the United States, but Americans aren't sure that we're going to stay in it because soybeans. Well, if, we're, if, if this really is the kind of challenge Washington describes, it isn't just going to be about soybeans. This is going to go on for a very long time, and there are going to be real costs incurred. China has a long tradition of personal suffering including suffering for the good of the nation. They call it eating bitterness, chirku, and it's the national virtue in China, their ability to take it. So the people are steeled against this stuff. They've been through a lot. And of course, China has a Chinese Communist Party controlled media that can control the discourse and to some degree hide the costs of competition from the Chinese people while America is a free and open society and we have polling and we have votes. So many Chinese during the, the, the trade war over the past year have become convinced that if this becomes a competition of privation, they can outlast us. They're pretty sure that we are casualty and cost averse and that they are tougher than we, that they have an advantage of will as rising powers often do over status quo powers. I've lived in China for 12 years. I think they're probably right. We may want to take that into account. But third question, even if Americans are willing to pay costs, how much competition can we really afford? China now has the world's largest consumer class. It is the major trading partner of most countries in the Indo-Pacific uh, and most trading countries around the world. Um, sorry, I've got to keep track of my time here. Um, I'm punching something in here. So, and even though, they have another big advantage. Even though China's economy is still smaller than ours, probably, maybe, kind of. It's changing. China's authoritarian government, its modes of governance mean that even if, if it's, though its total economic power is smaller than ours, China can place a greater percentage of its national resources at the service of strategic goals than we can. America is far wealthier than China, but most of that wealth is in the hands of the 1%, and Washington can't touch it to finance the competition with China. Beijing can touch it. They can touch anything they want. Uh, so where are we going to find the resources for this? We don't even have the will, as far as I can tell so far, to modernize our own infrastructure and our own interests. We're not willing to raise the gasoline tax, which was last raised in the early 90s, for that. Where do we find the resources for a great power competition with China when the most recent Pew poll says that Americans do not put great power competition among their top 20 priorities. Not sure it happens. Um, another question, and this is, this is sort of a big one uh, when we think about China. As I mentioned, Vice President Pence talked about everything that was wrong with China, that we disapprove of, that we think is dangerous, that we think is inhumane, and he was largely right. But the picture he painted of China was not complete. It was solely negative. And so if you, it's very easy you know, for America's you know, p critics to paint, to, to list everything that's wrong with America and to be right on every single count, but to nevertheless paint uh, a false picture of this country because they don't think about America in its entirety. This is also true of us. We talk a lot, and we should be, about China using technology to build out a surveillance state to build up soft totalitarianism. 
But when you go to China today, people aren't skulking in the streets. You feel the energy and the ambition and the entrepreneurialism bubbling up through the sidewalks. It's very exciting. People are justly proud of the improvements that China has made, again, at an unprecedented speed. And it's not just money, it's, it's education outcomes, it's health outcomes, uh, it's even the degree of personal freedom that they have in China. Uh, despite China's human rights record, as bad as it is, until Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, I'd be quite comfortable saying that this was the best time in Chinese history to be a Chinese citizen even from the point of view of personal freedom. So it's a complicated situation in China. And if we only focus on the negative, if we do not have a China policy that comprises China in its totality and its complexity, then it cannot be an effective policy. Last and perhaps most importantly, in this competition with China, what do we envision? What are we aiming for? Has anyone proposed a vision of stable relations between a powerful, prosperous China and a powerful, prosperous United States? The answer to that is no. No such vision has been proposed as a guide to strategy. So it's not just that Washington doesn't know how Americans view China, whether they're willing to suffer to counter China's power, whether we have the resources for effective competition. More fundamentally, we don't really know what we're aiming for. We've only described what we don't like. Despite these deficits in America's understanding of our relations with the PRC, if you go and you read Vice President Pence's speech on October 4th, you'll see that he moves directly from listing China's sins to declaring that, quote, we're modernizing our nuclear arsenal, we're fielding and developing new cutting-edge fighters and bombers, we're building a new generation of aircraft car carriers and warships, and we're investing as never before in our armed forces. He goes right from, this is why we don't like your face, to we're upgrading our nuclear arsenal. It's not really hard to interpret the juxtaposition of these two phrases if you're sitting in Beijing. So those are, the, I think, the, the conceptual deficits in our strategy. What should we be shooting for? How should we go about this? It's going to be very hard. I think the short-term challenge is to normalize our rivalry with China, normalize competition. This is not yet a new Cold War, as I've said, but it is useful to recall that during the Cold War, the US and USSR were able to normalize and manage their enmity because they had a common understanding of the causes and the extent of their disagreements. And because they knew the logic and the limits of our co the competition, they were able to exercise mutual restraint and even to negotiate and cooperate when they had to. If you normalize rivalry with China, you put guardrails around this relationship and a floor under it. Right now, there's no floor. Right now, we are still caught up in responding to this transition from engagement to contentious relations, and there's a lot of fear and a lot of confusion. We want to normalize rivalry. If you think, um, can I see hands on um, George Scott's Patton movie? This looks like a crowd where maybe a lot of people have seen it. Is that all? Well, there's a scene, if you remember at the end, there's this great scene where the, the, the Nazis have been defeated and the Americans have met the Soviet generals in Berlin and they're drinking a toast. And a Soviet general and an interpreter come up to Patton and the interpreter says to Patton, you know, the general would like to invite you to have a drink with him. And Patton says to the interpreter, please tell him uh, that I do not care to drink with him or any other Russian son of a bitch. And the interpreter gets really nervous and he says, I, I can't tell him that. And Patton says, you tell him, you tell him every word. So the interpreter is pretty sure he's going to get shot and he's sweating and he tells the general. And then the general gets upset and he speaks back to him in Russian. And, and then the interpreter says to Patton, uh, the general says that he thinks that you too are a son of a bitch. <laughs> and Patton smiles and says, okay, I'll drink to that. Son of a bitch to son of a bitch. And they lock arms and they, and they drink the vodka. Now, I'm not suggesting that we swear at each other or call each other names, but there's something to that to acknowledging and not trying to wish away these differences and to acknowledging that this is rivalrous uh, for the long term. And how, so how do you do that? You do it, and this is old school diplomacy, you do it by defining your national interests vis-a-vis -vis the other country. And this is what's also missing from Washington's approach to China right now is a clear definition of our national interests. I would argue uh, in the interest of time uh, and also strategic coherence that there are three. One, 
And when I say interest here, I mean things that we're willing to pay real costs for and to risk conflict for. We need to make it very clear to China, to the leaders, to the Chinese people, to the American people, and to the world that it is in our interest to prevent China's dominance of the Indo-Pacific, which is a key, China, uh, key Chinese goal. Chinese dominance in Asia would cripple our alliance system, it would undermine international law, and it would precipitate a regional nuclear arms race. And we need to prevent that. That's a strong national interest. But even as we oppose Chinese dominance, we have to be prepared to accept increased Chinese influence in the region. China's influence in the region is inevitable. There's a sense in which it is a historic development. And also, if we're going to have a stable East Asia Pacific, we need to lower China's threat perceptions. We need to give China some sense of comfort and increased influence, even as we prevent dominance. And that is within our ability, working with our allies uh, and by looking at uh, our force structure. This is something that we can achieve. The second interest is to prevent the spread of Chinese illiberalism beyond Chinese borders. I said earlier that one of the goals of Chinese foreign policy uh, is to create a world that is wholly accepting of Chinese Communist Party prerogatives and practices, many of which are illiberal, deeply inhumane, and not in the world's interest. Basically, we don't want to live in a world that is increasingly amenable to a Chinese Communist Party that is increasingly aggressive internationally and repressive at home. So we need to work to counter Chinese illiberalism internationally. At the same time, we need to recognize it and welcome it when China provides genuine international public goods in accordance with international best practices. And this is within our ability. And then third, we need to avoid a new arms race with China that comprises not only nukes, but also cyber and space-based weapons. And avoiding a new arms race with China is going to require new dialogue mechanisms and treaties between the US, China, and third countries. So notice that this pursuit of American interests, as I've defined them, or if it's something roughly in the ballpark that I've defined, do not preclude engagement with China. In fact, achieving these interests demand engagement with China. We need to focus on negotiations, confidence building measures, joint and multilateral rulemaking, and cooperation on important uh, issues where we can work with China, like combating climate change, global fisheries management, promoting global health, poverty alleviation, peacekeeping, setting international safety standards for food, pharmaceuticals, consumer products, combating human trafficking, and reaching technical and ethical understandings to regulate new technologies uh, as, as they emerge. So China is indeed a grave challenge to the United States in many respects. But China is also not as confident, not as competent, and not as certain of its domestic and international course as Xi Jinping would have you believe. Deng Xiaoping said of all of his reforms that China is crossing the river by feeling the stones. That means we're making this up as we go along. We don't know. If it works, we'll do it. Uh, if it doesn't work, we'll stop doing it. This was the great genius of Deng Xiaoping. And actually, China is still doing that. The story of modern China is the story of change. And it's still the story of change. The voices that say China is an existential threat, one of the premises of that claim is that China has stopped evolving, that its course is set, and that it's a monolith moving inexorably in one direction. And it's not true. China is still changing, and there is a great diversity of views within China. China is also, as I said, not omnicompetent, and it is deeply constrained in a number of ways. It faces a hell of a to-do list. It has trouble on its periphery. You're reading about Hong Kong. They've had 22 years to convince the people of Hong Kong that becoming part of the People's Republic of China was a good idea and was in their interest. China hasn't made the sale. They've had 70 years to convince Xinjiang and Tibet that it was good, a good thing to be within the embrace of the motherland, and they haven't made the sale. They've had 70 years to convince the people of Taiwan that they should also return to the embrace of the motherland, and there they really haven't made the sale. It's going in the opposite direction every place. So China isn't even controlling its own inner borders terribly well. China has problems that could cease its economic development rapidly that come from debt, enormous problem with debt, demographics, as they have a rapidly aging population and no social safety net. They have a massive problem with corruption, which is acknowledged but hasn't been changed. The problem of pollution, 
the water shortage in the north of China. Any of these could put the brakes on in a relatively short period of time. Their problem with the rich, with the rich poor disparity is even greater than ours. There is great resistance to Chinese power, including in Asia, and they are stuck with a sclerotic politics, a Leninist, a system that was borrowed from a Leninist Russia in 1921 by a desperately poor, isolated, agrarian China. That's the same system that they're trying to adapt to guide this place that is one of the most dynamic places on earth. And even China's own leaders see China as fragile. So yes, it is a grave challenge in many respects, but it continues to change. Normalizing rivalry with China by defining American interests, as I propose, is not a panacea. Uh, it is an urgent next step if the two powers are to avoid war, and we have to avoid war. Um, and this, this, um, this next bit is going to be a little corny, but I decided to risk it. Because I was looking at my notes again two nights ago in the pool at the Steamboat Grand. <laughs> and I was, I was thinking about the fact that so many in Beijing and Washington are now seriously talking about war. And as I was doing this, uh, there was a, a sort of a pool guy bartender, pool guy, weight room guy who was working there. And his wife brought his, their probably two-year-old son to the other side of a glass partition. It was toward the end of the workday. And so you've got this, this, their son sort of you know, going nuts, daddy, daddy, and they get around, they come in, and they're, you know, typical ordinary, very mundane, ordinary scene of just an ecstatic son and sort of the glow of a family. And I, I know that this is sort of banal and it may seem corny, but we have to remind ourselves that that scene recurs all over America and all over China every single day. And despite the real challenge from China, sometimes you do have to sort of slam a fist on the table and say, we really shouldn't kill each other. It's insane. Part of our strategic thinking has to start with that and reason backwards, because I think that if you go to Beijing, if you go to Moscow, I was just in Moscow in, in June, these are very attractive, very dynamic places in, in many ways, and it doesn't, um, you don't feel the enmity on the streets. Now, making that kind of appeal to not killing Chinese families, the realist school of foreign policy analysis in the United States would reject what I just said. They would laugh at it uh, as bleeding heart, unreconstructed hippie sentiment. Uh, and how can you indulge in talk of families when there are hypersonic glide reentry vehicles to be developed? The Realist School of Foreign Policy states that nation states, sovereign nation states, by definition, are maximizers of power. And that moral considerations that I've just, of the sort that I've just invoked don't enter into it at all. I think that we have to reject that view, or at least temper it. I think that the realists are wrong. Because a nation's power or interests derive from its values. And of course, those always have a moral component. I've been working in international relations now for 33 years. And the realist school has some valuable insights. But international relations, talk about international relations, is only coherent when viewed as a subset of human relations, which always have moral considerations at their core. The great novelist and theologian, Marilyn Robinson. Has anybody read Gilead? <coughs> Great novel. Um, Marilyn Robinson said this. She said, my politics and my religion as well are based entirely on the loveliness and value of ordinary human lives. The creaky apparatus called politics shelters or oppresses or threatens these lives and is therefore of interest. That, I think, is the best use of therefore I, I've ever read. We don't really need a deal with China. We need a relationship with China. There is no choice about this. We need a strategy that enables us to counter China, yes, but to also to cooperate it, with it when we can. This is going to be a decades-long, uncertain, expensive process that is going to require both nations to change in difficult ways. It will also entail testing, hedging, waste, irresolvable security dilemmas, and dangerous games of chicken. Uh, we are on the cusp of that. Uh, but the great, the, I, I believe that in the end that the greater the need to prepare for conflict, and we must prepare for conflict with China, but the greater the need to prepare for conflict, the greater the need to reflect on our common humanity and to remind ourselves that, as President Eisenhower said in 1953 in his Cross of Iron speech, every gun that is made 
every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. We can avoid war with China. This lies within our ability. I'm not sure that we have the strategy to do that right now. And there is a sense in which, coming back to our title, we are barreling toward the brink. In China, which is getting far more repressive, and as I said, is moving from authoritarianism toward a kind of soft totalitarianism, there is no dissent. So the Chinese government cannot hear recommendations from outside of Beijing about how to conduct the relationship. But in America, we don't face that problem. And we need to hear in Washington voices from outside of Washington. So I hope that uh, whatever you make of this problem, the problem of US-China relations, you will raise your voice. I hope that local wisdom can help prevent a national and even an international disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. The questions have come in fast and furious. Right. Let me start with what may or may not be an easy one. But you said the Chinese people are happy. But if they're so happy, why does the government view censorship, internet isolation, uh, the way they treat dissidents so critical to their strategy? Uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't say the sentence, the Chinese people are happy. Um, I said that they are energetic, uh, ambition, ambitious, entrepreneurial, proud. Uh, no, but there's a great deal of dissatisfaction of various sorts uh, within China. Uh, you never want to speak of China as though it's all one thing. There's a, a Chinese phrase I like, Lin uh, Da, Dou Yo. It's a big forest, it's got all kinds of birds. Uh, <laughs> And so there Big are multiple, uh, multiple views in China, and there is considerable dissatisfaction. But that is balanced by deep understanding, especially among older Chinese, of how far China has come so fast. You know, this is um, a country that has a living memory of massive starvation in addition to civil war, invasion, whatever it might be. You know, for three years, from six, uh, 59 to 61, more people died in China by starvation than died throughout the world by a violence in World War II. A living memory of that, dire poverty, and they've come out of that. So while there is a, a great deal of distress in China and there are social dislocations, uh, we, we don't have time to go into all of that. In my experience, and this, I'm sorry, I have to go anecdotal because China doesn't have elections, it doesn't have public opinion polling, so we're stuck with anecdotal. Most Chinese accept the government's proposition that they face a binary choice, that it is either continued gradual improvements in well-being under the authoritarian Chinese Communist Party, or China devolves again into chaos of some sort and Luan, and it all comes unraveling. Now, we may disagree with them that they face a binary choice, but of course, they're the ones who have to work that equation, not us. So yes, there are multiple views in China. There's a great deal of, you'll be relieved to know, unhappiness and human misery of the usual sort. Um, but there is also a, a belief that stability is key to well-being, and stability is therefore more highly valued there than here. Thank you. Uh, a number of economic questions. Let me try to combine a couple. In terms of the money and the huge amount of property that, uh, and products that China owns within the US, and also there is concern that China can disrupt our financial markets by dumping or not buying treasury bonds. Uh, what would it take for them to do that, and how big a threat is it really? Uh, it is really not that big a threat. Uh, it, it's, it's an issue at the margins. A, a lot of Americans, I think having been misinformed by the media, think that China is America's banker, and that China owes mo owns most of our debt. That's not true. China is usually, they've tended in recent years to go back and forth with Japan, they are the single largest foreign holder of American sovereign debt. Uh, 
their total share tends to hover at around 7%. Most American debt is owned by Americans, by pensions, funds, whatever it might be. So China, six, they've been drawing down a little bit. It's closer to 6%. Um, so it's, it's not the lion's share of American debt. If they, and, and they haven't bought that debt, obviously, as a favor to us. They do it for themselves because of the trade deficit. They've got all these US dollars. And for them, the safest place to park those dollars is in American uh, debt instruments, right? If they sold them all at the same time to try to get back at us, the value of those holdings would plummet. And they would actually lose a lot of money. So the scale of it isn't as large as many Americans have been led to believe, and China c would harm itself greatly if it were to dump all of that debt in, in, you know, in a short time period. In terms of uh, the impact of the US pulling out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, on what is the impact on China's military and economic dominance in the Pacific, <clears throat> and also, how do the other influential nations in Asia, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, India, et cetera, um, help or hurt our relationship with China? And what does the pulling out of the TPP, if at all, have on our relations with those countries? Well, it's, it's a bit of a historical hypothetical because we don't know what would have happened, what would have happened had we joined the TPP. Um, but putting that aside, uh, I think that this was an enormous error uh, not because the TPP would have solved all of America's economic problems, it, it wouldn't have. Uh, but what, most of what the TPP did was ask other signatories to the TPP to uh, improve their own economic performance or uh, standards such that they met standards the United States already demonstrates. It would have brought other countries up to that level and would have show, demonstrated America's interest, ongoing interest, in setting norms and practices in the most economically vibrant part of the world. And it also would have ha had the effect of spreading what's called the more or less liberal American economic practices internationally. Instead, not joining TPP sent the opposite message. And, and the, the biggest issue here is messaging. It was seen as an expression of disinterest in the key concern, namely economics, of the most vibrant area in the world, namely the Indo-Pacific. And it happened in tandem with the declaration of an America first and a disinterest in American leadership generally. And this was the real radical change. Again, every president, Democratic and Republican since World War II, has felt that American peace and prosperity uh, depended in large part on trying to, in demonstrating leadership or at least influence to get more of the rest of the world to be democratic or to have market economies. And that involved paying costs to try to in improve these systems internationally. We seem to be out of that business now and withdrawing from TPP was a major symbol of that which left the field even more open to China which is already the major trading partners of all of these different countries. And that's, that's been the real problem with that. If you could create our tariff policy with China from scratch. Our carrot policy? Tariff. Oh, tariff policy. Yes. Okay. I thought you were talking about carrots and stuff. From scratch. What right. would you do? What would you recommend? Well, I, I, so th th there's been a bit of a shift here within Washington. Uh, you know, as you know, President, well, then candidate Trump talked a lot about how bad the trade deficit was and how you know, China was uh, cleaning out America, raping the country, all of this. There's really not that I've ever read a mainstream economist in the world who agrees with the president that the trade deficit per se is a problem. Trade theory says that your overall trade with all countries combined should be balanced, not that your trade with each individual country needs to be balanced. Uh, furthermore, a lot of the increase we've seen in our trade deficit with China was the result of taking trade deficits we already had with other countries and moving them into China as, com as companies moved from countries with which we had deficits to China and concentrated the trade deficit there. There's also a problem with the way that we focus on trade deficits um, with what are called the rules of origin um, regime that we're still working under. If China finishes and puts in a package, the usual example is the iPhone, it says made in China on that iPhone. That's not really right. Most of the components in that iPhone
were made by American allies, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. China does the final assembly, fit the few screws in, put it in the plastic package, and therefore they get to say made in China. But as the Chinese keep saying, and I'll come back, this is not going to end as a defense of China, but it's the tariff question. Um, most of the, the value, the profit in an iPhone, even if it says made in China, the profit, about 70% of the money banked, is in design and marketing. And that profit all accrues to American companies. About 10% goes to China, the rest goes to people who make the components. So there are a lot of issues with the trade deficit that, that mean that the deficit isn't a problem, therefore tariffs are the wrong solution. And this was why Trump was widely opposed when he first uh, imposed tariffs by economists and by the policy community. However, the views of the policy community changed a little bit because through tariffs, Trump did succeed in getting China's attention in a way that all of his predecessors had failed in bringing them to the table. Sometimes you got to hit the mule on the side of the head with a Louisville slugger. And that's what tariffs did, even if they were irrational with reference to economic theory. Because it is true that China's economy is not open, that it's not reciprocal, that they subsidize state-owned enterprises in violation of WTO rules, that there are other various non-tariff barriers to trade, and that they either uh, compel coerce is wrong, but they compel American companies to transfer their technology, or in many cases, yes, they do steal it. And those are the real issues. So if I had to come up with tariff policy, I would want to make sure that I was, had a way of addressing all those very real issues that Trump has used tariffs to address. He's right about that, which is why a lot of people now hope he stays the course on tariffs and doesn't cave, even though the trade deficit really isn't the core problem. But what will the outcome of this be, of this policy in the trade war, if I can use that phrase with China? I, I, think, I don't know what the end uh, is going to be. I think that we might just have uh, tariffs in perpetuity. Uh, that This just may be the, 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 the state of play with China, that we have tariffs because uh, China doesn't address any of the so-called structural issues in the economy. There is also a chance, I think, um, that the American side caves and that the president ends up accepting what his predecessors accepted, which is Chinese purchases and promises. Uh, I think that he would do that if he felt that it was in his political interest with reference to the 2020 elections to do that. The longer the tariffs go on, the more they cost Americans. The stock market, which Trump likes, doesn't like the tariffs. And again, he's already had to come out with 27 billion to date for farmers. And that's an additional tax on Americans. He's been claiming that China has been paying billions into the coffers in the tariffs. This is wrong. It's not that his opinion is wrong. It's not even an opinion. It's just wrong. Okay? You know, if, if, if some scientist says that, you know, objects unsupported don't fall toward the center of the earth, that's not a different opinion about gravity. It's just wrong about gravity. Okay? <laughs> tariffs are paid by the, the companies that import them. So this is costing Americans more and more, and I think that it will come down to um, what he thinks will benefit him with reference to the 2020 election. But I don't want to predict where this goes. I, I don't know. Well, as one of the founders in, of the Wilson Center uh, said, Pat Moynihan, and quoted last, uh, in the last seminar, uh, people are entitled to their own opinion, not to their own facts. Um, <laughs> But I, f I forget who it was who said about some other philosopher that he wasn't even wrong. <laughs> um, and in, and this, with reference to this particular claim that the Chinese are paying the tariffs, it's just, it's just not true. Do we, and, and could you contrast what the average American's understanding of these issues is versus the average Chinese understanding of these issues? <laughs> especially with the free speech limitations they have on where they get their information, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I'd say broadly speaking, the Chinese are interested but not informed, while we are informed but not interested. <laughs> um, the, sorry, thank you. Um, the Chinese love to say that we know, far, Chinese know far more about America than America knows about China. And I think that's broadly true, but it's also true because they're playing catch up. And so they're looking for external models. During the thousand to 2000 years in which China was 
the number one nation on earth, China had almost no interest in other countries um, because they were top dog. So I, uh, and a lot of Chinese can get around the internet, um, but there, we have a lot of information, but I don't think that Americans are, are really woke, broadly speaking, on these questions yet. Uh, you just briefly mentioned Huawei. Yeah. Um, and could you, what, what about it? Because in a rural area like Steamboat, and 5G is really important, and getting it is important. Right, and it may be that only Huawei can provide it at an affordable cost in the short term. Um, as I said, there is no American company that can provide the, 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 the hard the equipment build-out, telecoms build-out for, for 5G. Um, Huawei is nominally a private, not a state-owned company in China. Uh, this is a meaningless distinction. Uh, all companies in China under Chinese law with reference to national security must take any orders that are given from Beijing and must provide to Beijing any information that it requires. And so the very reasonable suspicion about Huawei, which is, ba is based on both what we know Beijing would like to do and frankly is also based on, uh, based on what we know our own capability to be and what we're doing, so we assume they are, um, is that any relevant data that Huawei can garner will go into Beijing and can be used for espionage and can be used to develop cyber weapons that can take down our critical infrastructure. There's another level of critique now, which is that uh, AI, artificial intelligence, in the not too distant future is going to be the key to military power, economic power, soft cultural power worldwide. And data is the oil that fuels artificial intelligence. As deep learning gets better, um, you need more data to make deep learning of computers more effective. Therefore, there's also a fear that Huawei, through all this build-out, will get access more than any other, China will get more access to the world's data than any other nation and will therefore have better artificial intelligence. These are all very reasonable, in fact, I would say essential suspicions and I wouldn't let Huawei into any critical infrastructure or government system in the United States. Um, I, I just think it would be naive to think otherwise. That said, um, there is, it's true that there is no smoking gun, no proof that Huawei has inserted uh, unacknowledged back doors that it can use to gather data. But this, this, so the suspicion is real. The problem is, as your question implied, is what do you do about it? In most of the world, in much of rural America, Huawei is the only vendor that can provide, at cost and on time, uh, a 5G build-out. There are other, Samsung, South Korea, uh, Ericsson and Nokia can also provide all of these routers and servers that you need. There are other possible vendors. Let's see if you can guess where Ericsson and Nokia manufacture their routers and servers. <laughs> right. So what difference does it make? Also, even if we have our own proprietary networks internationally, in terms of routers and servers and all of the other hard equipment that builds out a 5G network, that travels by undersea cables, most of which are built by <laughs> Huawei. And we know that they can tap into those cables from submarines underground, underwater, I mean. So again, it's a valid point, it's a valid concern but it fails the practicality test. And as I said, the fact that we don't have a competitor to Huawei is our fault, not China's. Military, we haven't really touched much on it, but the buildup in the South China Sea, uh, where is it heading and what should we be worried about? Sure, so you know, China built out these artificial it's islands. Uh, they are heavily and increasingly militarized and China uh, is already using that, uh, those features uh, to intimidate its enemies. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's not its enemies exactly, but the other claimants to the South China Sea Islands. China's policy in the South China Sea has largely succeeded uh, from Chinese point of view. Uh, this was what was called the salami slicing strategy. China's very good at long-term planning and very good at gradual acts, which we see as provocations, but which are never quite provocative enough uh, 
to justify an American response. The idea of salami slicing is, you know, we all live in a dormitory and there's a really good salami in the refrigerator and every night China comes downstairs after we've gone to bed and uses a razor blade to slice off a really thin slice of the salami and eat it. And we never notice this until the whole salami's gone and in China's belly. They're, they're, they're very good gradualists. Uh, so in the South China Sea, they've achieved that, uh, but they have not challenged the free movement of ships through the very important sea lines of communication there, nor are they likely to um, in the short term. We still have more absolute sort of military power than China does in combination with our allies in East Asia Pacific, but China's been very deft at building up anti, uh, non-symmetrical capabilities, which make us think twice about our old platforms for delivering American power. Aircraft carriers are largely symbolic. They can sink them uh, from land bases, and increasingly, we don't, when we war game out potential scenarios in the South China Sea, we see ourselves losing. We see ourselves losing. This so say China is prevailing there. Um, I spend, every few years I go out to PACOM, now Indo-PACOM, our military base in Hawaii that is responsible for all of the services, military activities in the Eastern Hemisphere. Five years ago, the top brass there spoke very confidently of exercising preeminence in the Western Pacific. They now speak of demonstrating presence. It's not the same thing. Uh, so China is building its relative capabilities there, and this is a big concern for us. Just a couple more, because you've been answering our questions for a long time, but we're going to hit you for a couple more. Hong Kong, uh, where do you think it will, or how do you think it will be resolved, and how do you compare it, for example, to Tiananmen Square? Well, the, the latter question, how do you compare it to Tiananmen Square? In, in Tiananmen Square, the students were asking uh, for a number of things, but broadly speaking, they were asking, for democracy for China as Chinese patriots. And you all know how that ended up. The demonstrators in Hong Kong are really rejecting the, the idea of being part of the People's Republic of China at all. The, the proximate cause was a, a, a bill which would have allowed uh, Beijing, the Chinese Communist Party, to extradite anybody they wanted to from Hong Kong, including Hong Kongese, or anybody who happened to be transiting Hong Kong, to Beijing. But what this really is, is a rejection of the notion that Hong Kong should be part of the PRC, and these are mostly very young people who see very few economic prospects, uh, and young people tend to um, you know, be, be less risk averse than older folks. Like the Tiananmen students, I hate to say this, uh, they hold no cards and they cannot win. So this, this ends either with some kind of accommodation that gets them off the streets, or it ends in violence. But Hong Kong is part of the People's Republic of China, full stop. And there's nothing the people of Hong Kong or that the United States can do about it. So this is gonna play out within that context. And if Beijing sees what's going on in Hong Kong expanding, or having an influence in China, or tending to destabilize mainland China itself, then the soldiers will leave their garrisons. The Chinese soldiers stationed in Hong Kong, there are 6,000 of them, um, stationed sort of throughout the territory of Hong Kong. They've never left their garrison since, since the handover in 1997, uh, but they will if they think that this threatens China's stability or China's territorial integrity. You mentioned um, Taiwan, Tibet, and Hong Kong. Uh, could any of these really cause China to break apart in the way that, for example, people today are talking about Scotland and the United Kingdom? No. Uh, Scotland is, to a considerable extent, sovereign. And insofar as it isn't wholly sovereign, that is by its free choice. Uh, it is in no way analogous to Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and Tibet are all part of the PRC. Um, they have no autonomy, and I'm really sorry to have to say this, and it's, I'm not telling you where my heart is, I'm telling you what I think. You know, Tibet independence, I know that Boulder is a big center for that. Um, lost cause. It's not going to happen. Xinjiang is a lost cause. It is not going to happen. We, you know, if the world ran on historical moral justice, should we give Oklahoma back to the Cheyenne and the Kiowa? Yeah, probably. Not going to happen. It's just, it's just, 
all these historical analogies are imperfect, but all three of those places are solidly part of the PRC. Taiwan is a little bit different. It has never been governed from the, by the People's Republic of China. It is still outside of that fold, and that is a different case. So it, it's not a question of Taiwan breaking away. It's a question of whether mainland China can ever absorb Taiwan into its governance. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Not, only through violence in the short term could that be done. Last question. In my introduction, I mentioned your role in uh, Sesame Street a long time ago. In 2019, could something like that happen? Or could you do a co-production? <laughs> yeah, now for something like Sesame Street, I think, yes, you could. Uh, there is still a lot going on. There's still a lot of cooperation between the United States and China. Uh, Sesame Street, they don't think poses an existential threat to China. <laughs> But, and they've actually, they've, they've, they've gone back at it again. Interestingly, the first time we tried to do Chinese Sesame Street in the mid-90s, we thought it was going to take the country by storm, as Mickey Mouse had and Tom and Jerry had, uh, and it didn't work. Uh, and I think the Children's Television Workshop did everything right, and our Chinese partners at Shanghai Television, for the most part, were also superb. They did everything right, and it still fell flat. It made not even a blip on China's cultural screen. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that, but the main one was cultural, which was, and it was interesting that the Sesame Street is really based on the, an old vaudeville skit. Each, each Sesame Street bit, whether it's Muppets or live action or an animation, is tied to a specific edu educational goal in a curriculum developed by educational experts. The child will learn to recognize the number five. It could be something very simple. But then they have writers who write comic skits about that, where, and they're all the same in that the structure is the same. They're presented with a problem. You get increasingly ridiculous and humorous and failed attempts to solve the problem, and then a resolution with a twist. And it's very funny. Chinese Sesame Street failed because the Chinese writers could not marry humor to education. <laughs> no, this is really key because it, in China, all education is achievement-based, and it comes out of the sit down and shut up and learn this Confucian tradition. And humor is not allowed, and especially Sesame Street humor. These guys really are unreconstructed hippies. If you think about Cookie Monster and Grover, these, are, these guys are anarchists to the core. <laughs> Ernie is all about, you know, he's the Taoist who makes the Confucian Bert look like a fool at every turn. And so that, you know, vaudeville humor, humor in education could not happen in a country where education was very didactic. But in today's China, even a more repressive Xi China, they would still be willing to make the attempt at a co-production. Whether it would work, I doubt it. Xi Jinping doesn't have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> well, Robert, you... <laughs> you really have married humor and education, and we thank you for both. Thank you.